It's a curious gospel about the ten virgins. But let me look at this, uh, first of all, from a biblical standpoint, to look at maybe a deeper understanding of what Matthew says to us here in the 25th chapter near the end of his gospel. There is a parallel, not precisely the same, not the same story, but the same thought, found only in Luke, it's in chapter 11, no, chapter 12 in the Gospel of Luke. Since we're coming to the end of the liturgical year, we, meet, we uh, visit every year these readings about the end time. It's called eschatology. Eschatos in Greek means last or the end. And logos, literally it means word, but it means the study of the last things. Final judgment, death, judgment, uh, the meaning of eternity, um, what happens after we die. All of this is considered the subject of the theology, the part of theology called eschatology. Keeping in mind that in the church of Matthew and at that time, they were expecting the end of the world to come very soon. And therefore, they're very conscious of a theology that will speak to what happens when the end of the world comes. In simple form, in the theology of eschatology, there are two portions. One is called future eschatology, and the second is called realized eschatology. Now, future eschatology has to do with the future, what happens after you die, and I grew up with a very strong emphasis on future eschatology. I mean, if you commit some sin, you could go to hell forever. So you tended not to commit sin, not because of anything now, but what will happen in the future? When you die, you'll be in hell, and hell is forever, and forever is a very long time. So you must uh, concentrate on what happens after you die, that's what shapes the conduct of your life now. Realize eschatology has to do with the kingdom of God being here now. But let me look at this future eschatology for a few moments. Um, when you get older, you're an elder person, future eschatology tends to come more into focus because you think you're closer to the end. And when you think you're closer to the end, you begin to think, as I have, I hope everything is over there after I go. And in future eschatology, very few people went straight up. Some went to hell and others, maybe the better ones, went through some kind of purgatory, which could last a long time. But then we prayed fiercely that you would be released from purgatory. Or we did indulgences. That was a whole theology of future eschatology. And by the way, for those who you have been to the Sistine Chapel, or if you read about it, Michelangelo has the great statement of the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew in the Rerdos, the final judgment. And uh, when Michelangelo shaped this masterpiece in the Sistine, he did it in 1509. And at that time, the emphasis on future eschatology was very, very strong. Keeping in mind the church was very corrupt at the time. I mean, the Reformation will begin just a few years later in 1517. That's when Luther made his big statement and the Reformation, the whole separation began to happen. So we're living in a time back there when future eschatology was emphasized. It was the primacy of living the gospel. And you'll find in, uh, in Michelangelo's uh, final judgment, 
depiction of Matthew here. On the right are all those who are saved, and they're looking out, and they're looking up, and they're bright. Their lamps are lighted, they're bright. On the left, Sinistra, and the sheep are on the right, the goats are on the left. You're left-handed, you're sinister, you're a goat, you're in left field. All of that is part of the imaging that Michelangelo uses. And on the left, there is darkness. They're all looking inward. They're all self-interested. And they're the ones who are condemned. So you have the image artistically of light and darkness, which attaches itself to this gospel reading, dealing with future eschatology. So let me try to extract something from this reading that deals with realized eschatology, which is the kingdom of God is now. So why should I follow Jesus Christ? And why should I live the word of God? Because it makes my life complete now. Because it's, it's my best person. It's, it's the deepest part of my soul that I want to live a good life. I want to be honorable. I want to be truthful. That's the ideal way to live. That's realize eschatology. It means the kingdom of God is now. And the kingdom of God is now, and I'm going to live now in the kingdom of God. Now, to lift a teaching out of this, since we are not most of us are not thinking about future eschatology. Most of us, I mean, really the elders among us, we might be there, but most of the folks, they're not looking at the end of life. They're thinking about, how do I live my life now? And the symbolism in this gospel is very strong. The wise ones keep their lamps lighted. The foolish ones are asleep. They're in darkness. The wise ones connect with the moment. The foolish ones miss the moment. And to live realized eschatology, to live in the kingdom now, we must connect. You have to connect with the moment. Connect with the revelation of now. What's happening to you at this moment? How is the kingdom of God present in your life now? And if you think carefully, you will find this has a real presence in our lives. Think about the liminal moments in your life, defining moments, here and now. Decisions you made, whatever you have done in your life, either light or darkness. Um, especially at this time of the year, we'll find it in families. Do we connect? Do I enter into somebody else's life? Am I a person of light or a person of darkness? A person of life or a person of judgment? A person who binds up, heals, unites, or a one who divides? Pause and consider how this has a presence in our families. And in a special way, during this time of the year, divisions and misunderstandings and wounds in families and in close relationships become more present to us, become more obvious. So think about the kingdom of God now and having a lamp lighted now and not living in darkness. You have to pause and think about that. The moments in your life when you could have given light and instead you were asleep, you missed something. You missed something very important. You missed the grace of the moment to heal, to forgive, to include, uh, to somehow make this a better world. When you think about this, you also consider the church. I was reading an article recently from the tablets, an English theological magazine comes every week. 
and it said, Irish teenagers don't do church. And that may be true for us too. Our teenagers don't do church. But then you wonder, you know, the biggest Christian denomination in the United States is the Roman Catholic Church. The second biggest are former Catholics. No, this is true. Statistically, that's true. Now, they don't leave the church. They go to another church. So you wonder, I wonder, if they left the church or if the church left them. If we hold people on the margins, the manner of our liturgies, uh, the manner of our theology of inclusion, the manner of our patience and understanding, how to enter into another person's life, how to belong to another person's wound, how to align ourselves with people on the margins, people who disagree with us, how to reverence the presence of diversity, how to get a church into this model of realized eschatology, so that you begin to wonder if many persons who have left the church for whatever reason, people who don't think they're welcome, who think there isn't a place for them at the table of the Lord, you know who they are, I know who they are, and we begin to wonder when we look at realized eschatology, if actually they are separated from the church or we separated them from the church. I also think it applies to our social condition at the moment. Whether in fact we're living in realized eschatology in our country, we're so divided, we're so angry, we're so divisive, we're so certain that the other person is wrong. No matter what our persuasion, no matter what our opinion, the notion of entering into another person's life and understanding the fears and the needs and the hopes and the dreams of other people. The big issues that face us today, how to be open and to listen and to care and to make the kingdom of God present in issues like immigration or issues like health care or issues like abortion, to try to understand the mind, the feeling, the struggles, the fears of others. How do you do this? How do we get the kingdom of God realized in the present age? How do we reach out and include people, listen, begin to be patient and understand, bless people with the light? That's the teaching of this word of God today in the present context, since we are not in future eschatology, and that isn't our consciousness. We don't think the end of the world is going to come imminently, and therefore that's not what moves us. What does move us, though, is keeping your lamp lighted, alert, be prepared. It will happen it will happen in your family where you're going to respond in darkness or in light. It will happen in the church. Uh, whether we're alive and we're living in light or we're in the darkness of judgment and division. It will happen in our social order where we have to try to listen and appreciate and reverence, especially people with whom we differ. That's what realized eschatology really means. It means that somehow the kingdom of God is now, and the kingdom of God is inclusive, and the kingdom of God in the power of Jesus Christ is among us to heal, to forgive, to include, and therefore, from this, we are cautioned, keep your lamp lighted and be alert.